Hello and welcome to the Rapid Power Podcast, where we ask power addicts some power platform and some non-power platform questions. Now, let's get started. Welcome to episode four of Rapid Power Podcast. I am Vivek Bhavishi, um, the host of the show, and today we have two amazing guests with me. Um, these two people have always amazed me by the solutions that they have come up with. And yeah, I, I'm just really happy to have them today on this podcast. So without further ado, let's introduce our first guest, uh, Matt Devaney. He's a Power Apps developer at Dachi Solutions Canada. And uh, he's a business applications MVP as well. So thanks uh, for joining, Matt. Thanks for having me, Vivek. Yep. Uh, we'll prove it again that you are not a uh, cat today. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's why we did the video, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and our second guest today is Sancho Harker, again, a business applications MVP and a solutions developer at Pinnacle Group. Thanks for joining, Sancho. Thanks for having me here, Vic. All right, so go ahead, Matt. I don't know if this is well known or not, but Sancho and I are actually pretty good friends. Uh, we we play video games together on the weekend, and uh, yeah, we oh, bond nice. over our shared affection of cats. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I chose both of you guys for the podcast. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, thanks again for joining, and uh, we have some good questions from the guests today. Uh, hopefully, you'll have a lot of fun uh, talking about the answers. So uh, let let me start first. We'll first do three power platform questions, um, and then we'll do three not so power platform questions. And uh, if there's time, we'll probably do a bonus question, which the guests don't know about. Ooh. <laughs> uh, all right. So let's start with the power platform question first. Um, so talk about an app or a flow that you created and that has helped you personally, and it could be something even which helps you in your productivity at work. So, uh, but something that you made for yourself. So Matt, w- what do you have? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I've got an app that, um, as much as it helps me personally, it, it really actually helps my daughter. She is about two and a half, three years old, and she loves books. And she really, really, uh, she's really just starting to read. And she really likes those books that have all the different pictures in them and all the different you know, words underneath them. You have to memorize each one, right? She will go through each one and point and point and point. And so what I decided to create is I made my daughter a little flashcards app to kind of help her learn how to read. Um, and how it works is it will bring up a random uh, word that she she knows, hopefully. <laughs> um, and I'll ask her, you know, what is what is this word? And if she can't uh, if she can't find it, if she doesn't know what it is, uh, then I tap it again and I bring up a little bit of a picture. <laughs> and she's able to to go through the app and uh, kind of created a little bit of a like an infinite uh, what would you call it infinite flashcard type of app <laughs> for my little kid there. That's pretty cool. So can you keep updating it? Like oh yeah. Keep adding- yeah, it's super simple. Like in order to add a new, um, you know, a word or something, you just got to add another word to the data source to like SharePoint and then attach an image beside it. And you know, you could do randomization. If once she's into it, you could pretty much put points there. <laughs> I, I'd love to do a daddy records his voice type of thing one day and uh, read the word back to her. <laughs> That'd be a lot of That's time. Pretty but, cool. Uh, yeah, it That's keeps pretty good. Yeah. yeah. And have you? Okay, well, one last question on it. Have you gamified it? Have I gamified it? No, like, it's just because she's she's so young. She doesn't understand games in that way yet. <laughs> okay, okay. No, I'm just I was just curious uh, because you, you have made some really cool games. So yeah, yeah that's but, true. But I do think she is going to be a little bit of a of a gamer like my like her daddy. <laughs> she always wants to rip the iPad out of my hands and uh, daddy, can I press letters? So maybe a typing app is next with some gamification. Nice. <laughs> Cool. Uh, what about you, Sancho? Well, I got this, it's kind of an obscure one, but I made this flow, right? Um, so what, what we've got is like a list of approvers. And normally what the app would do is like it goes and pokes that list via the flow and checks all the approvers and then returns back a result. But it wasn't quick enough. So I made a flow that literally just 
takes all of those once a day and compresses it into a single text field. And that way, when I want my app to check what whether someone's an approver, all I have to do is their email address in and the single text field. And that that the, the time saved, like in working in the app was massive, but it was such a simple thing. And just like because the, the, the list only probably changes maybe like a few times a month. But yeah, compressing it into a single text field and then having it just easily accessible. And then because they're all in there, you just do a that email address in list of approvers and it just works. And that that's I mean, it, it's it's so simple, but <laughs> it, it, yeah, it was very, very effective. And the time taken now between actually checking is is like almost instant because it's just going against one field instead of doing a apply to each and going through every single approver of like 50 to 100 people. So like crazy. But yeah, that was <laughs> that's my thing. <laughs> that's super cool. So uh, help me understand. You said how do you combine all those into one text field? Like, so like, do you still have to go through a loop for that? Yeah, yeah. So like once a day, at like four in the morning, oh, okay. it um, goes through and just concats it into one nice. compose, and then oh. I push that back into like another nice. list that just has okay. one field with one item in it, and that's it. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I was like, otherwise that, you're doing the loop otherwise for something else. So. But yeah, you're doing yeah. it once in a day, and that yeah. Is, so, so yeah. when the people use it, they just tap it, and it goes, "Yep, that's approved," or whatever. Yeah, that's absolutely ingenious. I I want to see a blog post about that one because I want to start it's, doing it's it planned. too. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the queue. It's in the backlog. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm oh, thinking awesome. though, it, it, another approach would it be to use um, like tap into the the entity or the table in Dataverse? to do it well, quicker this, like a filter query in this case it's because the um the app is tenant wide it's uh, the the data stored in sharepoint because otherwise i see it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of licenses okay. needed and yeah, yeah that's no, not happening that right sense. now maybe in the future. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay no that totally makes sense what about yourself Vivek? uh so um i use it to to simplify i use power automate to simplify my shopping experience um, oh, so I have I, I use Google Home uh, many throughout my and my basically a Google kind of home. Um, I would say all my devices and everything connects to Google's kind of smart home network, I would say. So I have all these Google Homes uh, and every time I want to add something to a list, I'm either making something and then I realize, oh, I need that. And every other then I will have to pull out my phone. I have something in my hands. I don't want to spoil my phone. Right. <laughs> so I have connected Google. So there is a an applet in IFTTT. If you don't know if this, then that. It's similar to Power Automate, mm -hmm. but um, use, it's like a consumer version of it. They made it like now we can only have three applets for free. Otherwise, you have to pay a premium. But I only use like two or three things on that. Mm -hmm. So um, when I say add X, so you can do like add. There's an option add dollar when you say that to Google Home. It adds, um, I mean, it it uses that dollar sign or basically that text, and you can do anything with that. So it recognizes what you said, add this. And then um, I have an HTTP request being made from there. So it calls a flow, which then adds it to my to-do kind of a shopping list uh, category that I have, and it adds it to my to-do app as a shopping list item. <laughs> so that way I have all my Please. items from my Google Home to my to-do, and this doesn't end. I have another flow, which so I have a Meyer uh, nearby. It's like, a, I mean, for for Sanjay, it's like a, one of the superstores here, like a Walmart or something. Yeah, yeah. So uh, when I get closer to that, I have a Power Automate flow going. When I am that geolocation, geofence, push me a notification with all the items that I have in my shopping list. So that way I don't even have to open up my app or anything to do. I have everything in my one notification. That's amazing. Holy yeah, so, cow. So, so. so it ha I, this is something which I preach by. It's not just I made something and never use. I use it every day. Uh, so yeah, that's something that I use. 
you're the you're the king of this type of stuff. I think a while back I saw on your Twitter feed, uh, I think you were taking a look at the barcode of your wife's makeup or something like that to find oh, yeah. out the price. Yeah. W- was that technology like that that those flow steps were they similar to what you did in this one or uh, was that something that was, completely different? Yeah, that was the AI built stuff. So I had done yeah. an object <laughs> detection to to do that. But yeah, uh, I, I, I like doing yeah, this... really complex stuff. Who never yeah. A lot of times these things don't even get looked by a lot of people, but the the, the cool part of it is mm-hmm. something that people enjoy, but nobody wants to build it. <laughs> I just I think you yeah. had the shocked look on your face when you found out like how much it cost. You're like, ah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was fun. All right, man. Well, what question do you have? Uh so question I got for you, Sancho and Vivek. We'll start with Sancho, is uh what what are some underrated connectors or you know actions for power apps or flow that you feel more people should should know about what's what's an underrated connector and if you can't think of an underrated connector maybe maybe a feature so yeah what's an okay. underrated connector um i've actually got one that came up today literally um and it's it's lower because what lower. people often do is um when they when they're starting up an app they do some kind of validation against you know like a an admin list or something like that and they use user.email against something that's stored either in SharePoint or in anywhere else and the problem being is that most times um, when you get it from AD Active Directory the email address is case insensitive it's it's actually got uppers and lowers because Active Directory doesn't look at that it just assumes everything's lower and we'll treat it as such. Whereas if you've been storing it as one and then reading it as another, it'll just say that person doesn't actually have access. So wrapping everything in lower when comparing email addresses instantly just makes that no longer an issue. Um, and then the other one I was thinking of was um, in terms of validation of, well, everything, you got your starts with, ends with, and contains. And that's sort of like you're figuring out what's inside it. And then when you want to poke it around, you've got substitute, which obviously replaces pieces inside. You've got left, right, and mid. Right. So getting so, from the left, something in the middle or the right. Yeah, all and these being power functions, yeah. And then find to actually locate the part in that string that you want to mm-hmm. start from, for example, if you're using mid or substitute. So those, those I think people don't use those enough and sort of just that, that helps a lot in cleansing the data before you go and store it off somewhere rather than having to deal with it later in Power BI or something like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I would say that lower thing definitely, I learned it the hard way. I was like, I did something and I was like, why is it not matching? Like what's happening there? <laughs> and then I had to do the lower function and yeah, so yeah, that's, that's a good one. Um, so, my answer is kind of towards Power Automate, and it's not a connector, but actions. So all the data operations, basically compose, filter, select, I feel like those get underrated because they are just kind of standard actions available. And a lot of times when you're working with like array of data, um, the filter and select like are really helpful, uh, especially also when you have to pass data back to Power Apps or something like that because you want to get rid of things where there are nulls or things like that or empty um, items. So I think these filter and select specifically, I I guess, are not something that people realize how powerful they are, Hmm. but really help you in kind of filtering out your arrays and um, or doing something with arrays basically so that you can send that item on or kind of manipulate your data well before you send it. I definitely kind of, don't use filter enough, that's for certain. Yeah. I think I kind of just take everything in and then deal with it in the app, which is probably not the best way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> like for, for yeah. someone like me, like I, I, I'm not great at those data operations in Flow, like, but if I want to actually go ahead and learn them, like where do you think is the best place to, to go do that? Is there a certain resource uh, on the web somewhere? Or, or I, some technique. I, I don't suggest. know. No, I I don't have any. I guess I don't have any resource. But it's a good point. Maybe I'll uh, try to find out and put that in the links in the description of the show notes. Sounds good. 
And, and for those of us who are just like, uh, you know, listening along in the podcast and the video here, you can see Sancho's uh, kitty cat has showed up and we're all kind of <laughs> chuckling under our breath. Yeah. <laughs> we have a, another special cat, cat life. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, for me, like underrated connectors, again, I'm going back to, to power apps here. There's there's two I think are really underrated. Uh, the first is the uh, the Excel static data connector. Have you guys ever heard of that one? So there's an import. It's actually, it's oh, called yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. So there's a really well-known limitation in power apps that you can't have over 2,000 rows in an Excel file. You know, if you're connecting to it oh, yeah. as a data source, you know, from, from OneDrive. Uh, but if you need to just store data for read only, you know, in an Excel file, you're not actually writing anything back to it, you can actually import that data straight into your app in an Excel file using a connector, right, straight from your desktop. It's not a live connection, but it's there in your app. So if you want to do something like store all the postal codes in your app so you can, you know, show where someone is on a map if you're not connected, that's great. If you want to do a flashcard app like you did, like I did for my daughter, you could store all of the possible words in that file and it would work completely, completely offline. And so I don't think a lot of people know about that. And I think it's, I think it's really uh, underrated. Yeah. Um, the second is what, the word, what's that? Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to ask, what's the limit on that? I thought it was 100,000 rows or something like that, or 10,000 rows. Or even uh, that has a limit, right? It does, but there's a workaround. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you have to put the, the rows inside of something called an Excel table, which has a lift, limit of 15,000 rows, but you can create as many, um, tables as you want in that file so you could put hundreds of thousands of records in there <laughs> potentially um and if you guys have heard of the word document connector for flow mm -hmm. yes. yeah so what it does is it uh, allows you to take data from your flow and put it into a word template uh and then you can you know send it via email you can convert it to pdf and send it via email and mm -hmm. You know, when I hear people talking about, I want to get information from Flow into a PDF and send it out, they're always looking for the free way to do it. And they're always looking for the HTML way. And that's very, very difficult. And it's so easy with this word connector. And I'm just like, just pay the 10 bucks. It's 10 bucks a month. <laughs> you're, you're learning HTML, CSS, like all this stuff, but you could just pay 10 bucks. <laughs> for the price of a Big Mac, you could be sending out PDFs. <laughs> Give up the burgers. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I really think both of those are underrated. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good one. I mean, yeah, the, the cost sometimes, it, it's like, oh, it's a premium, and people just say that, oh, it's a premium, so I'll have to pay that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's not a lot, right, for getting that premium for just one person or one service account kind of a thing. Right? Yeah, it's yeah. we're not paying by the person, right? We're just giving that access to a service account, and then you, you mm -hmm. pay for it once, not for 100 people in your organization. So yeah. yeah. So yeah. Well, that's, that's a good one. <laughs> Um, so the second question I had for both of you, I really, really love asking this question because I, I love coding. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Matt. Uh, okay. Uh, I think we, we'll go through the Power Platform one first. So oh, sorry. Sancho's going to ask, and then we'll uh, go to the non-Power Platform ones. That's okay. Yeah, it's all right. Uh, go um, ahead, Sancho. So what question do you have? Yeah. I was just going to ask, um, how often do yourselves integrate Power BI into your solutions and why? So um, I, I was like laughing a bit because I don't, my answer was going to be not so much. <laughs> uh, but the reason why, I'll give you a reason. Uh, yeah. Because we have a B, like a different BI team who does all uh, that. So we just give, share the data with them um, and they kind of work on it. Now, as, a, as of this recording, I'll be joining another company, which will be Hitachi Solutions. <laughs> So I don't know what's going to happen there. Uh, so I'm going to join Matt. Um, so yeah, we'll see how, how they use. But yeah, in my previous company, there was a different BI team. So I didn't use it much. Uh, but we still used Power BI. Like personally, we used it for manage user adoption mm -hmm. um, on CRM or Power Platform to just look at usage activity. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it's a powerful tool. It was just that one organization, I mean, I didn't have control over it, so I didn't do much with it, but I want to learn more. Uh, for me, like I, I haven't used it so much at this uh, in this previous role, but like when I was working uh, for a small construction company in my hometown, uh, we really used it all the time. And what gets back to you is, you know, eliminating the paper and, you know, you're sending all of these paper documents via email 
and you generate each time you do a thing in the app or the flow, but then nobody knows which is the right version of that thing if it's been sent uh, multiple times. Mm -hmm. So I, I we were using it quite prolifically, right? We were just using it for that one-stop shop kind of dashboard for you know you know safety stats, you know productivity, uh, that type of thing. And I just really love how like a dashboard really is a single source, you know, of of the truth, and anybody can get the data, you know, anytime. So I'd, I'd say like I was using it pretty much all the time. How about you, Sancho? Well, that's yeah. I like that you said that because that was one of the things I was actually going to raise about it. Is like, yeah, it's it's like a live version of the the thing you would normally attach in an email to a prospective client or into an in internal team. And for me personally, I, I it's almost an exception if I don't use it on any of my mm -hmm. solutions because we we do have a um, Power BI expert, but. For some of the smaller stuff I'm building, I'll still put a Power BI on the front of it because otherwise it's just, you're generating all this data and then it just does nothing. Whereas you can get people some real value out of it by just showing them where it all heads into a point and how <laughs> they can use it best. So yeah, for me, it's like it's it's it's, it's an, it's an almost, almost always thing. I think um, there's only like a few exceptions where I haven't implemented that. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely super powerful. I think in the like a lot of people are again worried about the licensing side of things, but realistically, if it's a small number of people, and for example, if they're in the same team, you don't even technically have to publish it and share it out because if they all have the same level of access, and you're not worried about your data concerns for for security, you can actually just give them the PBIX and they can run it on their own. Mm -hmm. or, Power BI desktop. There's there's no licensing requirement for that, so that is a is an interesting one to look at. <laughs> no, that that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, the, there are always ways to to kind of if it may. I mean, PBIX file. If you're not changing it quite a few times, you, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you just share the PBIX. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Yeah. All right. So now that we have covered the Power Platform questions, let's jump on to some not so Power Platform stuff. So, um, so what app do you use a lot on your phone? Not the generic uh, social media or any camera mail settings kind of apps, uh, but something which you use, uh, which not a lot of people know about. So you're telling me I can't talk about my uh, prolific use of Twitter <laughs> to share power apps <laughs> tips <laughs> as a cat? <laughs> Oh man, um, I have I have lots of games on my phone. Uh, the one I'm playing right now is called Thronebreaker: The Witcher Tales, and I don't know if you guys have seen The Witcher on Netflix, but it's kind of like a, a dark fantasy type of show, and um, it's it's kind of a collected kind of card game. But the problem I have with the app is there, like I'm about 35 years old right now, and there's this really really small text that you have to read on the screen, and I'm like, I need I think I need glasses. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so it's a really, really good game when I can, when I can read all of the things on the screen. Um, but like something I use for productivity personally, um, have you guys ever heard of the Microsoft lens app? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So what this is, is, uh, it's an app where you can take a, a photo of any document like on your desk and it kind of acts as a personal scanner. So as you can see, uh, from the video for the folks at home on the podcast, uh, you can't see this, but I'm actually working from a bedroom right now and I have all sorts of documents I work with each day. I just take really good, high-quality photos with them, and you know, turn them into PDFs, send them to people. And I absolutely love this free app by Microsoft. Like I use it all the time. And you can even join like certain photos together um, to make one continuous stream, a continuous PDF document. I use it all the time, and I love it. And I absolutely swear by it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna add a, a tip over there. There's an Office 365 app which has mm -hmm. the same lens feature. That way you see all your office documents, everything really? you can open them as well, and you can still use the lens feature. So I think they're not updating the lens app that much anymore so, because everything is on the office app. I didn't know that. I'll, uh, I'll take that under advisement. <laughs> you can actually, um, you can replace your whole phone launcher. So I've done this for my work phone with the office launcher. So it, it actually like integrates the whole Office experience into your mobile oh. instead of just accessing it as a separate app. I've used that and that's super cool as well. Nice. Awesome. For the Android um, users, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, so um, the I was thinking the apps that I mainly use, and there's one which is going to be like a, well, it's, 
it's Authenticator. I 2FA absolutely everything. And I probably use that more than anything else because every time I log in, I'm getting challenged for a, for a second factor authentication. And I can't stress enough how much people should be using this because passwords are not safe. It, there's computers now that can just whack through that in a small amount of time. But anyway, so there's that. And then there's this app called Sleeper with an A. Mm -hmm. And what it does, um, you can play all sorts of nice calming river and nature sounds and set that to a timer when you're going to sleep. And then eat. on the other side of that, it actually tracks the noises while you sleep and your sleep activities, so how much you moved and and uh, any sounds that came around. So for example, for me, I found out that the cats were at a certain time of night going absolutely ballistic because I heard it on the recording on the sleeper app. So yeah, I put some mitigations in place for that. Yeah. Nice, nice. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, uh, which authenticator app do you use? Loads. I've got the Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator. Um, there's one for gaming, so there's like a Blizzard Authenticator. Uh, it, I think I've got four or five of them now, and each nice. of them have different nice. um, 2FA plugs for that. So. Yeah, yeah. It was <laughs> surprising. So, uh, go ahead, Matt. <laughs> Sancho's phone is like one of those doors you see in a cartoon. It has a lock. It kind of, you know, lock every, every other inch, a <laughs> lock for the lock. <laughs> no one's getting in. Uh, More locks one day that. I was trying to do a 2FA for, like I sat down, I was like, okay, let me look at all the kind of secure, whatever place which I want is secure, I mean, more security. Of course, I don't need a 2FA for some of the, the normal like kind of websites, uh, but I was surprised that even some banks don't have 2FAs. And I was like, what the heck? Uh, I probably want to change my bank account <laughs> if they don't have a 2FA. So yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you on that, Sancho. You need to have 2FA for everything. It's just the times we live in now. There's, there's yeah. some sneaky people out there who will try to get in your account. And the more, it's like it's like protecting your home. The more you can do, the better. It's, just, it's not like you, you think someone's going to break in it's just you don't want them to ever have that opportunity yeah yeah oh i totally totally agree all right for me it's been um, i use ios shortcuts a lot so if you don't know about that it's basically again a version similar to power automate but for your phone um and i had some videos also created where you can use siri to trigger a flow um so I have a lot of shortcuts on my phone where I could, instead of going through my calls and favorites and calling like my wife or my parents, I just have shortcuts for them um, on the, the home screen so that I just press one button. I don't have to do multiple clicks. I try to avoid multiple clicks by having all these shortcuts. Um, so I, at one time I had one, or I still have that, scanning a business card. And that uh, there's a whole flow behind it, but. I just press that button. I, I can even say, hey, Siri, scan a business card. <laughs> and then it opens up the camera, it tells me to take a photo, then it sends it to a flow, analyzes oh. the AI builder and everything, and puts into my contacts and Outlook. So, so yeah, I use shortcuts quite a bit. They automate the automation. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <It's> amazing. <laughs> uh, all right, man. Uh, what question do you have for us? Okay, so um, I absolutely love you and answer this question because uh, I, I love coding and I love hearing, you know, how did how did people get into it? How did they kind of find their passion? Uh, if it is your passion, <laughs> I, I just assume because you're on your, this podcast, it's probably a passion for you. Uh, but starting with Sancho, um, I'm wondering, like, what's what's the story behind how you first got into coding and not necessarily Power Platform, but just coding in general? Oh, that's kind of a, it's interesting because it's, it's going to evolve into a power platform love story. But when uh, when I was really, really young, um, my dad was was a coder and I coded my first like little batch file programs with him like when I was four. Um, then he passed Whoa. a few years later and that kind of like threw me off and I didn't touch coding for years and years and years. And then, well, what is now a couple of years ago, I uh, found the power platform and that like, reignited all that 
awesomeness that is learning how to do low code, medium code, high code, all of that. So from learning Power Apps and Power Automate and Power BI, I then started fiddling around with C Sharp and JavaScript and trying to program games and all sorts of things. So basically, it's like just completely re-energized me. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's that's <laughs> that's kind of my story of uh, coding is awesome. <laughs> and you said four years old is when you oh, started. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's like that's wow. a whole other story of. Uh, I also I disassembled his work computer and rebuilt it, and it, and it worked at at that same age. So you're talking to some prodigy over here, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Your father Positive. passed along to you quite a gift. Like taking things apart and figuring out how they work. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. Uh, so when I read this question, I was like, okay, um, I went back to my like went back to memory lane, and there was one thing which really I I, I remember what triggered me into this. So um, this is all the way back, I would say eighth grade. Um, my I had a computer science kind of class then, and I mean. Uh, I grew up in India and there, I mean, he, we just started using computers around like sixth or seventh grade. Um, and uh, this is a revelation, but uh, I mean, I'll be honest, I, I used to mug a lot. I mean, any kind of things uh, I will, like, any kind of answers, question answers, I used to mug everything too much. Okay, <laughs> so there was this computer science uh, kind of uh, like, I mean, class that I had uh, this teacher asks something and I just like he asked me something about like H, like a window something like very simple word or window excel something like that and I had mugged it up and I now I, when I say <laughs> that I was like what the heck was I thinking then but everything I was mugging and I was like okay I'll just mug this up and I I, I read it out how it was read, written in the book and he was like do you really understand it though like you shouldn't be mugging up. You should really <laughs> understand what you're saying. And that kind of like, it, it's like bit, I mean, I was like, I took it to heart and I was like, I need to understand what's happening now. And at that time we were learning, started to learn HTML. So the first time I wrote an HTML code, I saved it and published it. I mean, published basically, I opened it on like a browser. Mm -hmm. I saw a web page kind of showing up and I was like, wow, this is amazing. I just wrote few lines of HTML and creates a web page. Uh, so that kind of triggered the fire, I would say. And then I started learning HTML, CSS. Uh, then I took C, C++ in like 10th grade, 11th. And I always, though I didn't do computer science engineering, I did electrical, I always had this kind of curiosity of doing things. So I kept learning like VP script, PHP, all that kind of stuff just on myself. So. I think going back, yeah, that's the kind of trigger that made me get into this. I guess I have to thank my computer science teacher for that. <laughs> well, you did you did the job right then. That's their job. Inspire you to 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 seek that knowledge, and it, yeah. it worked. <laughs> <laughs> that's so awesome. Uh, so so my earliest uh, memory of coding is actually. You know, it was actually kind of a low coding experience if I think about it now. Um, so if you guys remember when the internet was just becoming a thing, um, like on Yahoo, you'd have all these different categories of like web pages and you, it wasn't necessarily a search. You'd have to like go and find, you know, what subject do you want to take a look at today? And me and my friends, we really like this show. It's a Canadian show called Kids in the Hall. It's kind of like, it was kind of like Saturday Night Live up here. But it didn't really have a great web page. <laughs> so we're like, oh man, we're gonna make this web page. It's gonna have you know all the cast members and all the episodes and summaries, and it's gonna be this big thing. And we came across this thing called Yahoo GeoCities. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> it was this drag and drop website builder by by Yahoo. And we're able to go ahead and, and put this this website together with pictures and scrolling text across the screen and music. And you can probably guess by now what it didn't quite take off. <laughs> But I just, I absolutely love this thing. And then, you know, the strangest thing happened. Like I made a couple of websites, but the strangest thing happened. Like making websites kind of became harder than that again, right? It, responsive started to become a thing. And like now you need to actually know how to code to make a website. And so I actually stopped doing it for a while. Um, 
but I got back into it in a big way in uh, in high school. Again, I had I had a teacher. We had this information media technology class, and they said, "Okay, there's this contest you can go to, you know, build the build the best website or something like that, and uh, learn how to do the back end stuff as well. Best website in uh, you know my my home province of Manitoba." Um, and so that got me that got me going again, and you know I <laughs> this is terrible, but uh, I didn't actually learn all the skills you needed to technically like go ahead and win the contest because you had to learn how to design, you had to learn how to do the back end, and I didn't learn the back end stuff. But fortunately, when I got to the contest that day, they're like, "Oh, we're having trouble with our MySQL server. This is just all going to be about design." And I was like, "Yes!" <laughs> nice. And and on my shelf, uh, you know, to this day, sitting there with all my sports trophies from when I was a kid, is this silver medal. And it says four. Uh, web design. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and that's so that's, uh, that's how I got uh, back into coding and I uh, just continued to do it as a hobby from from there, just learning, you know, Python and JavaScript and eventually Power Platform. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, what about you, Sancho? What question do you have for us? So, um, my question is, uh, what non-tech skill or hobby have you found really useful in your job? Yeah, so I was thinking about this and then I was like, I actually did a degree in marketing. <laughs> That's quite useful. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, so I guess the questions now have become, you like this came up in previous podcast episodes as well, where we were talking about what would you tell your 20 year old self or 18 year old self, something like that. And I was like, don't worry about whatever you're doing right now, because in the future, you'll end up doing something different. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm doing Power Platform now, uh, which I never imagined. Uh, so, but yeah, it, being in marketing, kind of understanding the, I would say, I, I mean, before marketing, I, I mean, I was an electrical engineer. I worked kind of in pricing stuff and marketing even before um, doing a degree in marketing. So I, I kind of had a understanding of how business would work or, how, what kind of requirements business will have, trying to understand some of the terms and um, just understanding the, the value, right? I mean, I know everyone uses this a lot that what's the value of adding this? What's the ROI? What's this? So I know, I mean, you can easily learn these things by just doing some course, but yeah, doing a whole degree in it definitely helps. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, that, that has helped, definitely helped me in understanding whenever I do something, I just don't say, yeah, let, we can do it. I'm like, are you sure you want to do this? Can we do it this way? Will it give you more value? Will it make more sense? So yeah, that that is something uh, I would say my marketing definitely helped me there. That's a great angle to approach it from, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Those are definitely Matt? skills that'll always be valuable, Vivek. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> Um, yeah, similar to Vivek, like I didn't really walk a straight path in my career, and I actually have a CPA which is like an accounting designation. <laughs> so I worked on accounting designation for four years to go over and become a power platform a coder and developer, which doesn't really have anything to do with that at all. Um, <laughs> it, you know, except for it gives you a certain financial literacy. It gives you an insight into how do people make decisions. And you always are thinking about that, that bottom line and the ROI, like Vivek said. Um, but that's not actually the answer that I brought to the table. Um, like my non-tech skill uh, that I was thinking about, uh, you know, how's it help you in your job, is I like to do a lot of hiking biking um mm -hmm. uh like canoeing canadian right canadians gotta get the paddle and canoe everybody has canoe paddle no that's a lie <laughs> <laughs> um but like how that helps me is like it's it's so important to like find something that gets you away actually from the computer and, and take a break and to do that like i need to be away from my phone away from cell service and i just love to go off into the bush and you know start exploring and sometimes it's walking a path and sometimes it's getting off that beaten path and getting out the old GPS and just kind of orienteering a little bit and just, yeah, getting back to nature, man. <laughs> I absolutely love it. Yeah, that's cool. Nice. Very cool. How about um, you, Sancho? Well, uh, mine is really kind of out there, I guess, then, compared to those. <laughs> uh, so one, <laughs> the first one was uh, uh, piano, finally. Yeah. Um, and the reason why is, so with piano, like I trained myself to remember sequences of events, which are the keys that I end up playing. Cause I don't play with music. Like I make sure to learn everything by, by heart so that I can just play it whenever. Um, 
and yeah using that logic of being able to like stick things together in my head without actually having to see them um that actually helps a lot in building apps and solutions because in my head i'm sticking these pieces together as like eventually making one long music piece of of solution and then the other obviously is that when you play piano your typing speed just goes like through the roof because <laughs> your, your dexterity for your fingers totally. is crazy um and then on the other side the other skill i thought of was like art so i do like drawing um on the side and um i think that ability to like again visualize things how i want them to be in my head and then translating them to when i'm building them just pays off massively because i think a lot of people just make an app and don't really consider the the visual side of it until after you you, you clean up the app and and make it you know whereas i go in there thinking i want it to look exactly like this so i just start making it like that rather than cleaning up after the fact <laughs> oh, that's that's pretty cool yeah those are some two skills typing fast definitely would help <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no. Okay. So, time for a bonus question which you guys didn't prepare for. So, it wouldn't be that difficult. I just want to know what did you have for breakfast today? I I, I again I, I had a very Canadian breakfast. <laughs> Maple syrup and pancakes. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> wow. Just, well, I guess just, we didn't yeah, need to ask the question. Oh. We, you just gave a stereotypical answer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I pretty much just out myself here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I I guess mine's yeah. I just had a little protein bar and a cup of coffee, <laughs> and my vitamins, all sorts of vitamins. <laughs> nice. Uh, uh, I I had Indian kind of tea, and along with that, I generally have some snacks. So Indian tea is basically a lot of milk. Okay. Uh, the half yeah. milk, half water and like some spices along with it cardamom so yeah mm -hmm. I, i really like that to start my day off and just have something light with it um some indian snacks along with it so yeah it's it's a very typical indian breakfast uh yeah I had that i'm all about that half milk story it doesn't it doesn't matter what if it was indian tea or not normal tea coffee people don't like that i say this but i i love that that ratio of half half it just um, makes it so easy to drink you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh. all right so uh that's all our questions for today um before we end uh, matt if people want to follow you um or your content where, the, where should they look for yeah you can come check me out on twitter at matt b devaney it's spelled d-e-v-a-n-e-y um, i'm always giving out helpful tips on there to do with power apps and i've also got a website www.matthewdevaney.com Yeah, he has some really good blog uh, posts. So yeah, definitely check it out. A uh, lot of good stuff over there. Yeah, every word you said. So um, you can follow me on Twitter at I am underscore man cat. <laughs> <laughs> and, my, uh, and my website is I am man cat dot dev. And uh, yeah, I, I probably don't publish as much as Matt, who is just amazing at that but there's there's some good stuff on there yes <laughs> there is <laughs> all right uh so uh, uh, for all those who are listening please don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on anchor.fm slash rapid power it's available on all the other your podcast platform as well apple podcast google podcast look it up you'll you'll have it over there so um please follow us there and if you want to follow me Uh, my Twitter handle is that underscore API underscore guy and my blog is that API guy, that API guy dot tech. All right. Thank you everyone for listening. Thanks, Matt. Uh, thanks, Sancho, for joining us today. Thanks for having us, Vivek. <laughs> thanks for having us. Yeah.